I'm going to talk to you about streamlining the last mile. Um, and I'd be happy to take questions as we go along. Um, and if you have, you want to write them down, we can take them at the end as well, however you want to go through it. I'm going to cover these topics today. Um, and it's really an introduction to standardization of the supply chain. So that's the main theme. And when we standardize, it allows us to lower cost and improve processes. That's the basic idea. Let me give you some examples of that in the context of what you do every day. Uh, this is not about the last mile only. This is about how you use and reuse and analyze information. So just let's start with a basic introduction. You, you heard that from Jeff. Um, I work on lots of things. My passion is standardization and improving processes. Um, so in light of that, let me just do a little quiz. On a college campus, I love to do quizzes. So what is it that you see here that might be relevant to today? Or more importantly, what do you not see here? So what is it you see in these pictures? Right? Yes, sir. The machinery hasn't changed. These are actually taken in the same period, right? Anything else you see? People. People, right? Somebody's there at the checkout counter, all right? Attitudes, <laughs> that's right, friendly maybe. <laughs> A difference in attitude between the young lady over here and the young lady over here. What'd you say, Norm? Is your girlfriend? Okay, okay, yes. Um, well, let's look at a couple of things here that might have changed. What's that? That's a price book, right? Do we see those today? We don't see those today, right? Here's the phrase we hear today. Price check, price check, know that word? Why is that? Because this person today doesn't know this book because it doesn't exist. What else is here? That cash register, that's a manual cash register. Doesn't tie into any systems, it just is something they use to enter the information. These individuals, what's the age of these individuals? Compared to the individual that you see in the grocery store today. Now, let's just take this young lady here for example. You don't see a price book there. Why? It's in her head. That's right, it's in her head. Today, the information that's in her head is up in the ether, it's in the system. Okay? So that experience level that's there, that information has been conveyed into the system and enabled because of a simple idea. Now the other thing you see that's missing here, of course, is the automation of the the thing, but there's also no scanner here. You don't see a scanner to swipe the barcodes because again, it's all in her head. Now because it was all in her head, the average grocery store at this point in time had about 8,000, 9,000 products in it on average. Today the average grocery store has about 36,000 to 40,000 products. And so the, the analogy here to standardization is this idea of the barcode. It's a very simple concept. It was implemented over 30 years ago, and it's driven about $17 billion in cost out of that supply chain, while it has expanded the variety of products that we get to benefit from every day. Okay? That's an example of standardization. From an analytical perspective, and, and we're gonna hear it next from the next speaker, is that it also enabled these three Fortune 500 predictive marketing companies. So when you go into a grocery store and you buy something, there's a discount coupon. Well, these marketing companies, they have three of the largest data warehouses in the world. They're looking at patterns. They have your credit card purchases and your barcodes for 30 years. They know more about what you're gonna buy when you walk in the store than you do. And so they use the coupons to incentivize you to purchase things. And that's because they have all this data. And that data helps to do analytics. And you've heard about you know, big data. Well, these are people that have been doing it in the grocery stores for 30 years. And there's a big science to that, and it's because they can very easily get their hands on that data because of the barcode. So let me ask you another process question. Okay? Uh, this is a great question being here on the campus. Okay, now this is a process question. We got our calculators out? Okay, what, what's the answer to this question? 
Now, I, I spoke on the University of Florida campus uh, a few weeks ago, and I asked this question, and all the students pulled out their calculators. Okay? And I said, what's the answer? And some guy in the back of the room, he goes, B. And I said, do you guess or do you know? He goes, I guess. He was honest. He said, I guess. I said, now, here's the key phrase that's on this slide. It's at the very top of the page. This is a process question. This is not an accounting question. Okay? <laughs> so what I want you to do is to start thinking about processes. Okay? Now, I don't really care what the answer is. You know, for those of you that do, it is B. All right? But this is about processes. This is all about processes, okay? So let's talk about processes. Give me some examples of process and co controls that companies commonly execute. So what, what's the basic processes that you have? The accuracy cash recorded correctly as to a pound amount and period. We got the receiving cycle where we pull in cash and we record them. What's the other side of that equation? Payables, Payables procurement, that whole idea. What are some other cycles? One of our sponsors, Robert Half, is payroll systems. How do we deal with employees? Okay, so there's lots of processes we have, controls we have, and some very simple basic ideas, okay? So these are basic processes that all companies have, okay? Now, what are the physical locations for these controls and processes? Where do they actually reside? Where do they live? Here are some places where they live. They live in people like yourselves, they live in systems, they live in maybe work papers of some type, enterprise systems, maybe desktop systems. They exist everywhere, is the point. Now, how are they executed? Now we're going to start to narrow the gap. How are they executed? Well, they're executed basically in one of two ways. You've automated them, or they're manual. Now, there's lots of different ways to think about that. I can outsource it. I can do it myself. But that's the basic idea. That they're either automated or they're manual. And that's how they're executed. So let's look at the idea of where that actually occurs. So processing controls today, and this is to be a, a typical schematic. So I have a piece of software. In this case, it's some kind of warehouse. And in it, I have business rules. I have data. I have my entity descriptions, and I have some reports defined. And that's how it works. And back over here, I might have transaction systems of different types. Okay? And these systems are all tied to this system, so we're mapping tables here. And then when I get in here, I do the same thing, and then I consolidate them in something like Hyperion or Cognos or whatever, J.D. Edwards. And then I, this thing produces reports. Okay? Does this look familiar at some level to people? You may just have this, you may just have one of these, you may just have one of those, but this is basically how it works. Yeah? All right, so let's say that you need a piece of information out of this guy right here. How do you get that? How do you get it? Somebody has to either request it for you or they have to write a special report for you. Now, is that person that writes a special report, is that you? Or is it somebody in the IT department? Somebody in the IT department, right? That's how that works. So how do you get that information from over there to over here? Is it there's somebody else has to do that for you? Can you actually drill all the way through back over to this? No, that's the problem. So that in this environment, for an accountant, a business person, to request that information from back over there, that's a lot of opacity. And so the common way of access is a telephone or an email because people cannot physically access those more granular levels of system. The reports are really reflections of what's in the software. Okay? So I'm a software industry guy. Okay? I actually sell software that doesn't relate to anything we're talking about today. But I've been in the software business for about 20 years. And I'm a CPA and accountant. But the basic pitch of software is this. Please put all of your data in my software and I will solve all of your business problems. Okay? <laughs> and so when I talk to people about this, I hear things like, well, we have insert ERP name, Oracle, SAP, whatever. 
Um, we already have that. We don't need to standardize. We're already, we've already standardized on software. Well, that implies that you have all of your data in a single software application. Okay, so I got so tired of listening to that that I actually went to SAP in Germany and I said, okay, who is your largest customer? Because I want to go talk to him. And so they told me, it's, it's a guy named Taylor Hawes, and he works for a little company in, in the U.S. I said, well, okay, let me go. I know Taylor. I happen to know him. So I went and I talked to Taylor. I said, Taylor, SAP says you have the largest instance of, of SAP in the world. Is that true? He goes, yeah, I think it is. We, we have a huge SAP warehouse. I said, Taylor, do you have all of your corporate data in SAP? Now, what was his answer? Exactly. Exactly, no. But he only was able to say that after he stopped laughing. Okay? <laughs> And furthermore, he said, Mike, we're never going to have all of our data in a single software application because we're too big, we have too much going on, and the name of Taylor's company is Microsoft. Okay? So even a company like Microsoft, there's too much going on to have it all in one software application. But yet, that's what we as a business community have been buying for 30 years. You know, put all of my data in a single software application, and then it will solve my problems. Well, getting the data into the software application is a huge issue. You know, there's a lot of cost associated with that. And then when I get it there, these little lines, this is a multi-billion industri multi dollar industry called systems integration. And it's about mapping from this table to that table. Okay? What's going on there? So that mapping idea creates lots of inflexibility, not a lot of agility. And so we have a, a system where if I buy another company and I have a bunch more of those things, it's going to take me a year and a half to put them together. And so this type of environment, which we all kind of have grown up with, really is a very opaque environment. It's not very flexible. It's very costly to maintain. And as consumers, we get what somebody designed into the software at some point in the past. And if that information isn't what we need, then what do we do over here? Well, we use manual processes to assemble what we need. And a lot of you have been working with these manual processes for so long that it's just part of your daily activity. And that's the part of standardization that I really want to focus your, your mind on today and get you to see the opportunity that's available to us today. So the common problems associated with that kind of environment are the lack of transparency, the cost and time to change, I mean, when we think about the cost of this environment, we think about the cost of establishing this. We don't think about the cost of changing it or migrating out of it. So the exit costs associated with putting in a piece of software are huge because I've embedded all of my intellectual property in the software. Okay, so all those concepts are embedded in the software. So if I change the software, I lose that investment. So that's what I mean by the cost of change. When you think about it, you've got multiple instances of your business rules. I've got business rules in each one of these applications. So if I want to change a rule, I don't change it once. I change it X number of times, again, adding to the cost. Foot manual problems, et cetera. So these are some of the common problems associated with information today. But the fundamental idea is, as a business person, can I get what I need when I need it? All right? So how do we solve this problem? So here's a typical business objective for this solution. And this is actually a quote. You can go out on the internet, you can search on this phrase, and you can find it. And I'm not making this up. This is out there. And this actually exists because it's part of why you should have paid attention in history class. Okay. So the company who said this, here is the picture of their facility and the warehouse engine. Okay? Not making this up, true story. So where is the warehouse engine in this picture? It's right there. Now, what kind of warehouse engine is this? This is the first electric motor that was installed in a commercial facility in the United States. The electric motor replaced a steam engine, hence the warehouse engine. And you can see by the pulleys and gears in the ceiling that literally every piece of equipment 
in this warehouse was connected to that steam engine and therefore was connected to the electric engine. So think about what I'm showing you right now. We have one electric motor that everything is run off of. So if that, if that motor breaks down or if this piece of equipment right here breaks down, the entire factory has to be shut down because everything's connected. And so the thinking was one motor. Now today, if we went into a facility, there's literally thousands of motors in every piece of equipment. They're completely decentralized and, dis and disconnected. They operate independently. Why? Because electricity was standardized. People rethought their business processes. Much more efficiency. But back 100 years ago, when electricity first came on the scene, that was how they thought about it. The processes were very rigid. They weren't very agile. They were very costly. If there was a, a maintenance problem, the factory shut down until they fixed that machine. So I'm giving you this as an analogy because this is, in fact, the way a lot of people think about the data warehouse engine. Okay. So what does standardization mean to that idea? How does standardization change that? So let me give you some examples of why standards are important. Now, do I have students here in the class? Do we have students here today? OK, so here's where the students are going to be able to answer this question. These, this is another quiz, OK? So here is the, a gentleman who is a key person with respect to standards. So do we know what standard this gentleman created? Guys, ladies? OK, now, Norm, this is, the, uh, this is the Kent State University campus, right? It is. OK. And Thursday nights are a big night, right? Absolutely big night. OK, so does anybody know who this guy is? <laughs> this is a guy, and students, I, I, I guess I'm very impressed with you, to be honest, that you don't know the answer to this question. OK, this is a guy who invented, basically, repeatable yeast. In, in the brewing business. Because before uh, Miss Dr. Hansen actually repeated in, invented repeatable yeast, every brew of beer had a different orientation. So a producer of beer couldn't get consistent quality because every batch tasted different. But he invented the idea of repeatable yeast. He gave it away to his competitors, okay? And he actually created the beer industry as we know it today. And of course, his brand was Carlsberg. So this is a guy who created a standard that created an industry that we all, or some of us, may love and enjoy today. And it's very popular, of course, in our college pursuits. <laughs> so let's transition that to things that we see every day. Now, on the left-hand side here, you have proprietary technologies. These are all proprietary technologies, every single one of them. They start off that way. But standards turn them into infrastructure. At one point, there were different railroad gauges that went between cities, between Washington and Philadelphia, between Philadelphia and New York. There were different gauges. So you would put your goods on in Washington. It would go to Philadelphia, and people would take them off and put them on the other train to go on to New York. Now, what happened when they took the goods off and on the trains? What happened there? They lost them. And lost is a colloquialism for stolen, exactly. Fraud and defalcations occurred because there were differences in these proprietary technologies. Well, once they created a standard that allowed the train to go all the way through, that opportunity for fraud and defalcation evaporated. So here's the quiz for today. All you need to do is match the proprietary technology to the standard that made it infrastructure. So we'll start with railroad. So number one is equated to that's right. And that represents the width of a railroad gauge. So what else is that width? Guys, ladies? Horses' butts. Horses' butts, exactly right. Horses' butts are the same distance apart. Now, why is that important? Because if we went to Rome, we would find that that is the distance of a chariot wheels back in history. Again, that's why you pay attention in history class. Exactly right. Up, oh, telegraph. Number two is Morse code. Number three, I, telephone, telephone, A, RJ11, that's a little jack you have in the wall. Shipping, this one's a little tricky. Shipping, 
Shipping is B, the big metal box. It's a container. Product, exactly, we talked about that one earlier. Networking is F, that's the uh, Ethernet jack, Bob Metcalf. The internet, D, information. Ooh, what if we could standardize information? So RosettaNet, you know the Rosetta Stone is a translation stone, okay? So RosettaNet is a consortium of the technology community, technology companies, Microsoft and Cisco and Intel, those kind of companies. And they created this consortium so they could standardize the information exchanges in their supply chain. So RosettaNet is a consortium that defines literally all of the components of this computer here and of your computer, okay? So that they could communicate with their supply chain providers and buyers. So when Intel adopted RosettaNet and went from manual to automated processing and controls, they removed $500 million a year in their cost of, of producing and consuming information of how they operated with their supply chain partners. No different than the barcode in the grocery store, but that was the impact on one company in that supply chain. $500 million cost reduction per year. So that's the kind of impact that these standards have. 